Bruce Christensen is a clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist and is associate professor in the Research School of Psychology at the Australian National University. Bruce kindly agreed to be interviewed about the nature of the unknowns in clinical psychological practice and how therapists deal with them. So thanks for coming and doing this. My pleasure. Tell us a bit about how the, the kinds of unknowns that you come across in clinical psychology. Right. Well, in, uh, in giving that some thought, I thought maybe there's three major ones. I don't think it covers them comprehensively, but one would be when you're uh, intervening with a, a client and you're uh, giving them some sort of treatment, you're wondering whether or not that treatment's working. And that's a, a bit of an unknown that we have to grapple with. The second area is um, having to do with, with self-report. Clinical psychology largely relies on individuals to tell us about themselves. There's no objective test for diagnosis, etc. So another unknown is whether people are revealing themselves in a, a veridical or authentic way. And the third is, will somebody that you're working with do something dangerous either to themselves or others uh -huh. uh, in the future? Are there uh, particular kinds of disorders or, or issues that are more difficult to predict than others? I mean, I would imagine, for example, that, that predicting whether a client is likely to be suicidal would be mm -hmm. really difficult to predict. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, perhaps predicting on the basis of what you know about them whether they're likely to suffer um, episodes of depression, that might right. not be so difficult. Yeah, no, I think that prediction is a very central part of the clinical uh, repertoire. I mean, we're, we're faced with those types of problems all the time. Some, I think, are a little more salient, not because we're better at predicting them, but because there's more urgency or more salience around them. So certainly things in, in the realm of risk assessment, whether a client would commit suicide or injure or harm themselves, whether they would harm or injure someone else, and within the clinical forensic realm, whether there's risk for reoffending or recidivism. Those things are probably the thing that gets the most attention. They're all hard to predict. But I think the, the answer to your initial question, whether there's some things that are harder to predict than others, is a little bit of an unknown because those things tend to get the research focus and the other things get much less research focus because there's less at stake uh, when you're talking about the other things. But absolutely, prediction's a central part of what I think clinical psychologists do. Can we just go back to the unknowns for a moment? What about diagnosis? Mm -hmm. Is that a problematic area or is diagnosis pretty cut and dried in clinical psychology? Well, I... I hmm. I think that in, in general, um, things are, there are many unknowns there. Um, while there's a, a fairly established, not always agreed upon, but a well-established taxonomy for diagnoses, mm -hmm. uh, there's lots of disagreement amongst clinicians and there's lots of unknowns about hmm, the boundaries of that taxonomy and whether or not a client fits within the boundaries of that taxonomy and whether there's different weightings of different variables to make that determination of whether they're the boundaries of taxonomy. So there's, there's a clear taxonomy but not a necessarily agreed upon one and therefore unknowns mm. are inherent in that practice. So let me just um, follow up on that. So um, where's the boundary between being sad and having a clinical mm -hmm. um, condition of mm -hmm. depression? Where, how, mm -hmm. Where's that yeah. Uh, it's a really important and, and, and difficult question. I think the current taxonomy, the DSM-5, has taken a, a particular view of that, and that view is largely when the symptoms associated with sadness or depression become disabling in some way. It affects the, your ability to work or, or have relationships or, or, or live independently, those types of things. We, you know, there could be debate about whether that's the right sort of um, a criteria, but that's the one they take. Another question that's related but a little bit different becomes in that continuum between worried and anxious or a little bit sad and depressed, are they really distinctive categories? Are they apples and oranges that you're talking about? Or are they really just shades of, a, of the same color? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that when you're talking about that, how you distinguish them also becomes different. If you have distinct categories, the job of distinguishing them actually becomes somewhat easier. When you have just a single dimension, you're, you have a little more work cut out for you. So how do clinical psychiatrists, psychologists, sorry, how do you mm. clinical psychologists deal with that conundrum? How do you deal with those unknowns? Uh, I think it's a combination of things. Um, one is that there are the, the, the mainstay, the, the conventions, the taxonomy and the clinical experience and, and problem solving that people have adopted over years that guide that. I mean, and, and you'll see that every day in clinical settings where uh, 
people will argue based on their experience. Well, I've seen patients that meet that criteria but have these symptoms. And when they have those symptoms in addition to the criteria, I think it's something different based on my experience. But I think in clinical psychology, we are also fortunate to have um, quite a bit of attention paid to the research literature. So there are mathematical and statistical ways to test whether things seem to be uh, distributed as, as a dimension or whether they do represent these separate categories. And if, if you have that information, that, that goes so, some distance, I think, into how you view the, the disorder and, and what framework you bring to the interpretation of things. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, my understanding is that uh, a very popular, if, if, if not dominant, um, uh, approach to training clinicians is something that's called the scientist-practitioner model. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us something about that? Sure. Uh, it's unique to clinical psychology, actually. There's no other profession that formally adopts in their uh, training model uh, a combined clinical and research uh, acumen. Uh, I think a lot of that has to do with... Uh, historical antecedents for when clinical psychology became a, a profession and when they needed strict frameworks for how to train people. But also I think there is a, a, a pretty strict uh, value-based or, or philosophical position that clinical psychology has adopted that um, yeah, science does bring some additional aids to helping uh, understand the unknowns. Uh, it is a, an epistemological tool in that way. I've been involved with many clinics, anxiety and research treatment clinics, depression clinics, where there's a standardized protocol for assessing individuals as they come in the door. That protocol is then used to monitor the progression through treatment so that you're not relying, for example, on the clinician's feeling or judgments or intuition about whether somebody's getting better. You really have quantified data about their internal states. Right. Mm. Can we just come back for a minute to the scientific side, or the, act, the actuarial mm -hmm. side? So you've talked about how you can systematically gather data about a person. Mm -hmm. Is Are there also some examples you can give us of how that systematic co data collection is then used in some more predictive capacity in a clinical sense? Does that happen too? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there's lots of examples where the very clinics that I was talking about set up those structures in ways that they can gather data for those purposes, if that's, mm -hmm. if that's what you mean. And absolutely, people, people do that often. Um, can you spell out an example for us? That'd be great. Yeah, sure. Let me think of a, uh, of a good example. Um, right. So let me take an example from a research project that I was involved in since mm -hmm. I have a little more familiarity with it. Um, in treating uh, patients with psychotic disorders, in particular schizophrenia, there's a certain um, algorithm that clinicians use, particularly psychiatrists, uh, in using antipsychotic medication. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because one in particular psychotic medication, clozapine, is, is a very effective medication, but it, it brings with it some very serious side effects and necessitates extra monitoring that's uh, cumbersome and, and, and laborious. So, People generally go through an algorithm where you try these older medications, then some of the newer medications, and finally clozapine if none of those work. And we had a, a large sample of individuals who presented to us with their first episode of psychosis and were able to keep the database that you were talking about, or database like you were talking about. And what we were able to ascertain from that database after you know following about 200 patients is that when a person failed that first medication, the likelihood that they would actually respond to any of the next medications before clozapine was near zero. Mm -hmm. And in fact, rather than waiting for those medications in the intervening periods, you should go directly to clozapine. So I think that was something that probably would have never been ascertained, save looking at the data in an empirical way. And it's had quite a bit of impact actually on how people practice. And are, are there, um, so that's a great research example. Are there, are there examples you can give us from clinical practice where, um, so the, 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 the simplistic mm -hmm. image I've got mm -hmm. in my mind is that the clinician collects some data, mm -hmm. types it into the computer and mm -hmm. up pops a suggestion or an answer or something. Um, is there something like that that happens? Yeah, so there's there's nothing as formalized as you're talking about, although there's lots of people 
in informatics and, and, and things like that who are, who are talking a lot about how that type of evidence-based medicine could be available to clinician even at bedside with tablets, et cetera, based on you know, meta-analytic and systematic review type information. We're talking about computer tablets, not yeah, tablets. Yes, 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 computer right. tablets, yes, exactly. <laughs> so uh, as far as I know, nothing has really been formalized in that right. way, but certainly it seems to be just at the cusp hmm. of, of coming to the fore. I guess my sense of it, and I don't know if it's a completely accurate sense, but it's my sense, um, that there could be a tremendous amount more done in this. I, I think that lots of my clinical colleagues maybe could benefit from greater understandings of unknowns, of how they make decisions, of, uh, of those pitfalls. There's been pockets of individuals who bring that to the fore. Paul Muell was a great example. Uh, they're difficult things, I think, for clinical psychology to confront mm. in certain ways. Uh, they are confronting, mm. and and I I I, I, I dare say we uh, we're at a disadvantage for not looking at them more seriously. Uh, I, I yeah, I think so. Great. Mm. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.